Jesus name amen all right in Proverbs chapter 5 we finished up last time with chapter 4 looking at the uh, nature of the fact that man was to be one who uh, changed himself from his entirety to make it uh, based upon God's will keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. In other words, that heart, that mind, the soul or will of man that decides what he will do and ought to do. That's what Solomon is talking about needs to be kept with diligence. It's a working matter. It's not something that it'll be taught the way that it should go and be kept in the proper way by just kind of a natural path of life, whatever we want to do. It's only going to happen if we give great diligence or work to that and put it into use not only in knowing those things, letting it change our heart, but then letting it change our life as it springs forth from that. Go from there to chapter 5 now, and that's where we're going to try to get through is chapter 5 this evening. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion, and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her uh, steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable, you do not know them. Uh, we talked about before that he uses the term children and then sons and son in a singular sense. When he gets down to that word son, the particular one person that's speaking of, what is that usually doing? What's a part of the reason that singular is used? Anybody remember what we had talked about with that? Don't everybody speak at once. No. <laughs> All right. The idea of that particularizing, they're bringing some driving home, I think is the real point to that, that uh, there's an emphasis that's added when he brings it from children to maybe sons, and he brings it a little closer to son. The idea of the making of a particular point and giving it some emphasis seems to be the idea here. However... In this particular case, it's obvious that he wouldn't talk about all of the children because what he's saying is, you need to stay away from that immoral woman. And he's using that relationship of a man and a woman uh, being tempted to fornication or adultery. And so he's speaking to this man and saying to him, you need to think about what I've told you in this before. Why would Solomon know something about that? Okay, he had a lot of uh, wives and women, and how had they affected him? All right, they took him away from the Lord, is what we're told in the books of history with regard to him. And so he says, you need to pay attention to my wisdom and lend your ears to understanding. You look and you see what I'm saying. If you remember all the time when Solomon is writing this about the foreign woman, You remember the fact that many of his wives were foreign women. They were ones who were of the lands about uh, the area and some that were some distance away. But they had other gods that they worshipped, these false gods, the idols that were there. And as a result of that, it had turned his heart away from the true God. So he's trying to tell them, you need to listen. Son, you need to listen. He says that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. Now, not only in verse 1 is he talking about that he needs to pay attention to wisdom, to understanding. Now there's knowledge that is to be kept. But then what was he, what does he say? And your lips may keep knowledge. Now what does that mean? How do lips keep knowledge? It's not the way we would express it today, but how would we say that? All right, we'd speak the truth. 
which speak that which is according to God's will or what has been learned. That uh, first, before you're going to speak that which is best and right, what are you going to have to do? From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, so we've got to take care of that heart or that understanding, that will of man first. And then what will happen? What will happen is our words, our speech will then be affected by that and will keep the knowledge. He says now. That's what your lips ought to be like, that they keep knowledge. How about the lips of this immoral woman? The lips of an immoral woman do what? Drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Her mouth drips honey, but her lips drip honey. What does that, what does that suggest? There's a sweetness that's there on the lips. He goes on to talk about some people a little bit later on that within their mouth is a sepulcher or a dead bone, rotting is within. If you have somebody with honey on their lips, you aren't expecting that within, right? But that's the idea of how it's dressed out. And then he says that that uh, uh, lips of honey in the mouth is smoother than oil. That's not how we say it either, but I remember my dad used to talk about when I was a kid, he says, that guy's a slick talk. You know, it's the idea that he could, could make that little spiel out there and get you to believe something. And you see people like that, that they're practiced in this idea of enticement or whatever is there. And that's what you see of this woman, this foreign woman, or what's sometimes called the seductress. Uh, all of these things are describing what she's like. Now, besides that, it says, this is her beginning, what's her end? Bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. See the contrast? <coughs> that you have this honey sweetness but what's really there in the end? The wormwood, the bitterness of that. Absolutely the opposite. That you have this mouth that's out there, oil, smooth. But what's it in the end? A sharp two-edged sword. It'll kill you. And so you look at that and you notice the difference. Her feet, they go down to death and her steps lay hold of hell. This is a good place to notice what you see in this repeatedly. The word there used for hell uh, is the word heal. It simply has to do with death. Uh, when you look right above that, the word death that is used is not the word shield. Though normally when you see the word death used uh, in the Old Testament, it is that way. Uh, and great many times this one is used, uh, and it's uh, a word that really has uh, to do with the dying process or the dead body that's there in a physical sense. Sheol is the place of the dead, as you look about that. It is where one is consigned to after this life. So it is that uh, kind of a home of the spirit after that point. That's the way it's used. Many times the word hell uh, is translated as uh, uh, Sheol is translated as hell. Especially in the King James it's almost exclusively done that way. Uh, sometimes within uh, the New King James, sometimes in others. American Standard tries to uh, make every time the word Sheol is used, it uses that just as a Englishized word, S-H-E-O-L. And uh, all that's talking about is the place of the dead, or that which is uh, of that realm. He says, now, what's she doing? She's promising this sweetness, she's promising this goodness, but then what in the end happens? She'll kill you. The effect of what she's doing is going to be something that will bring you to an end. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable, and you do not know them. The picture here of especially the sexual sins that are under consideration 
are ones that show me there's nothing that's really changed. We're living a few thousand years after this, but it's still the same as it was then with regard to how that process worked. The concept is the promise of that one who is the seductress on the female side or that man who has that same kind of place from the other in attracting the woman. The idea is that if you'll do this, if you'll engage in this, you will know joy like you've never known it before. That's the greatest thing that you can do. There's this wonderful feeling or sensation that is there. Well, what's the end of it? For a few moments, you have what Moses is said to have not looked at the pleasures of sin for a season. That may be a passing kind of a joy that one would have or a passing sense of uh, uh, some excitement. But the fact of it in the end is it leaves one robbed and recognizing that robbery. I want us to talk about this as we go through. We're going to stop towards the end and start noticing how many ways that can be so. The sexual sins, unlike many others, are ones that are, I think probably it's safe to say by a long shot, they're ones that are warned about more in the Old Testament and the New Testament than any other. Why? Well, because that kind of a desire is there as something that is very strong with you. When you have that kind of a desire and that uh, sense of something that's driven really from uh, a sense of uh, our hormones, the way that we are made, there's the tendency to say, I want to just abuse that for a passing pleasure for this time. And we forget that that was intended by God to be shared by two people for life together in a relationship that deepened that love. It does grow a bond. That's the thing that makes it wonderful in marriage, and it's the same thing that makes it something that's so dangerous outside of marriage. But that's what he's looking at, and he's pointing out these ways. He said, if you're looking at things like she is, you're looking at this whole matter, and you're trying to see it in the way that she does, What's that seductress or that foreign woman doing? She's trying to get something from you. Most of the time we would think about this in the sense of prostitution and so forth, but that's not the only thing that's involved here. It isn't limited to that at all. It's the idea that here she's wanting you to view things like you do, but her ways are unstable. You don't know what that's like. You don't know what it's going to cost. And that's what sometimes I talk to young people about. If you're going to be one who loses your virginity, you don't know what that's like. But if you do so, and you do it in a way that uh, wastes that away, in a way that God did not intend it, then you're going to know something of a horror that's there as well. Because that's not how God intended man to live. It's not what man was intended to do with that. It was given for a purpose. It's right and good within that. But there's a danger of using it in any other way. Anything else there? Okay, let's go on down to verse 7 to 14. Hear me now, my what? What's he doing? Backing back out, general. He's made a specific application, now calling all of them to look at this. Therefore, hear me now, my children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others, and your years to the cruel one. Lest aliens be filled with your wealth, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner, and you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed. And say, how I have hated him and my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly of the congregation. All right, the advice. 
Hear me now, my children, in the general sense here. You need to listen to me in this way. Now, why is it that there in verse 7, they need to, or they need to listen, these children need to listen to the words of the mouth of this speaker? The speaker, of course, is Solomon, but what was he known to be speaking on the basis of? Inspiration, right? Go ahead, Blair. And wisdom. All right, the wisdom that he was given from God and inspiration as he writes this down. He says, I want you to think about this. What you ought to do instead of being attracted to her and going toward her, what you ought to do is what? Get out of there. Do not let this be something that uh, is what she takes you in with. Remove your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. You know, there's a lot of things about preaching that I have liked through my years. But there's part of it that I absolutely despise and hate. And... I think probably some of the effects of fornication and adultery are the ones that if, if I wouldn't say it's hated the most, it's close. I can't think of anything else uh, that I've hated like that in the effect of it. And the point is just made here. Instead of getting closer and closer to it, Remove your way far from it is the point. Don't try to get close. He's going to say this in a number of ways through the fifth chapter, and he's going to include that in the future here, too, as he goes on in chapter 6. But in this particular place, he says, Now, you remove that way far from her. Don't even go near the door. In other words, don't go inside. How do you keep from going inside? Don't come close. Stay clear of that entirely, lest you give what? Give honor to others. How would this sin give one's honor to others? How would that happen? intended is that this was a gift of a man to his wife and a woman to her husband. That it was something special in that sort of a way to help bind them together. When that's used in another direction, what happens? That honor of that place and the saving of oneself for that right relationship is given to someone else and what's going to happen? A lot of times those two are not going to make it. They didn't respect God's way and God's will. And they didn't respect each other to be involved in that, most likely. And the fact of it is they're probably going to split. And now what happens? Now what happens is each one of them tell others about that person. And there's a shame that comes with that rather than an honor. Your years to the cruel one. How's that happen? Their years. Sometimes years is spoken of as time or life itself. Fornication and adultery are known to be a way of spreading disease, isn't it? That's something that's happened over and over and over again. I've seen it both with heterosexual and homosexual lived through the 80s and 90s with the uh, problem of AIDS with no way of even treating it for a while I've seen a lot of young people who spent their life in a wayward sense either in drugs or in the sexual behavior ended up losing their life because of something that they tried that years that's taken away, if you don't take away the life, then what I have to worry about 
who's going to find out about this? What's going to be said out of this? Now, we've studied this before, and I wanted to make something or trying to point out. Scott kind of uh, came to me after the last one. I think he was right. I want you to understand, I'm not saying that somebody can't be forgiven of these sins. That's absolutely true. Where there's life, there's that possibility of forgiveness and coming to God, truly, truly repenting and uh, changing my way to be obedient to God. That's true. But you cannot change the product of the consequences that take place in your life. There's guilt of sin, yes. But there's consequences that can be with you that you need to think about and will be in the doing of these kinds of things of sin. He said, lest aliens be filled with your wealth. You ever heard of people losing their wealth because they were flagrant in their irreverence and in their immorality? I've forgotten what his name is, but the owner of the Patriots how much money do you think he has spent in trying to go after uh, the defense that he has where there wasn't any defense for being involved in a way that he should not? Still, he's looked at and laughed at because of what he did. You talk about people who he says, your laborers go to the house of fornication. Somebody else gets the benefit of what you've worked just fine because you end up having a problem. Sometimes that absolutely drives people to be insane. Sometimes they're trying to be uh, one who gets it back and they're blackmailed. You name the point. There's a lot of different ways that this can happen. But the fact is it all started through the fornication and adultery. Very few people think what could happen as a result of this? What could the end of this be? And here's what you've got. He said that you shall mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed. I don't think that's just talking about in a literal sense your body's consumed, but the idea of the worry and of the shame and all of that coming upon you, that has an effect of those kind of things. If you don't think it does, how many of you lived through the Jimmy Swaggart and uh, Jim Baker and Tammy Faye and all that era? Here were people who really had something that was there. They were respected in their circle at least. And then they were found out to be a bunch of frauds. And the result of it was they were uh, ones who lost uh, just about everything ended up with bankruptcy in each case, I think it is. Go ahead, Larry. You got something? Just, uh, the, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, if marriage is honorable among all, yeah. this is not. Yeah, the exact opposite. Uh, all right. Now, he says, here you are, and this is the end. He said, and you're going to say this, how I have hated instruction, and my heart despised correction. You ever been warned of anything with mom and dad telling you, you know, if you do this, you're going you're gonna to have problems. And then you do it anyway, and what happens? Uh oh You know, here I am. I was warned about this. Uh, these are the kind of things that people have seen before. Some wisdom would have helped if I would have listened to it rather than getting into this kind of a mess in my life. And I say, I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. In other words, it's my own fault. I should have listened, but I didn't. Now, what does that do to you? Well, you have to look at it, and you're going to suffer all these consequences there of sin. And you have to come back and look at it, man, that it is nobody that I can blame but myself for this. How do you feel at that point? Was it worth it? Is 
it seem like a good trade then to go after these things of the desires of the flesh? But you back up and you see is this is stupid. You know, I just can't believe I've done this. And it's that kind of a thing. All of us recognize because of sin at some point that kind of thing about us. We do something that we knew better than, and we did it anyway, and now we got the consequence of it, and there is nobody that we can blame other than ourselves. And he says, I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly and the congregation. That idea of I was on the edge of total ruin, who again is the speaker? Solomon. And yet Solomon, as king, has given more wisdom than anybody else, and he was what? On the verge of ruin. God was gracious to him in providing for him a way back, which in the end, Solomon, though he sought at times, did not end up in his life being one who came back to God. There's always redemption and forgiveness. But you know what? There's a redemption and forgiveness that usually takes place after somebody has hit the bottom. There's, a, there's an old adage about uh, drunkenness, drugs, and sexual sin that somebody can come back, but usually it doesn't happen until after they hit rock bottom. Now, the sad part is some of them hit that rock bottom and they don't come. They die there. Or their life is totally shot to the point that they don't turn around. But the fact is, there is a hope there in Christ for that forgiveness. But what's the better way of having that hope there in Christ before I get to that matter of being at the edge of ruin or after I'm there holding on by the skin of my teeth? Pretty obvious. So the point is that the, he, or that the uh, uh, proverb writer is saying, you need to listen to me and you need to listen to what's wise before it is that you ruin yourself. Verse 15, this is just statements of uh, kind of a, a proverbial way of thinking of looking at the value of some things in just a normal sense. Drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Why? You know where it's been. Okay. You know who got that. You know what's happened there. Now, if you go up and do that with a stranger, what are your problems? Number one, don't know anything about the origin of that. Don't know what they put in there. What else? I know it's not mine. But somebody might come out there and shoot me for being in that of someone else. In other words, you stay to that which is safe in content and in ownership in every way. He says, should your fountains be dispersed abroad in streams of water in the street? Is it wise to just seek that anywhere that's going around? He said, let them be only your own. In other words, only go after those your waters uh, that are yours and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. All right. He gave the illustration with water, but what's he talking about? He's talking about those marital kind of relations that you have with your own spouse, period. Not somebody else. You stay there with that and rejoice with the wife of your youth. There's that term again. What does that suggest? The wife of our youth. Same one you got now. All right. Same one you married early in life. Not the next one or the next one or the next one or the next one. But that one that you had in your youth, you continue with her. The idea was presented to us very clearly in Genesis chapter 2. That you be one who gives yourself to her and her alone, or him and him alone. And that death is that which severs that bond. Not anything short of that. So 
there is a continuing of that way. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. A lot of times you'll see the uh, uh, Catholic Church be involved in talking about the sexual desires and the sexual uh, relationship. Their concept of it is what they teach to their people is that is only for procreation. It's not for an enjoyment or in some way some enhancement of the two in their love. It's only for procreation. This is a passage that absolutely shows that's not true. There is a joy that is intended there within marriage to be uh, partaken of and to have one uh, that uh, is drawn close to that spouse in this way. That is a proper way. But he says, it's only the one that is your wife, that wife of your youth, that you're uh, satisfied with. Notice the point, always be enraptured with her love. Look at verse 20. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman? Anytime you see two words, they're the same. You, you look at it and say, okay, something's being put here in contrast very clearly. Uh, that word, to be enraptured, is a word that's interesting from the original language. It's the word saga uh, out of the Hebrew. And it really has the intent of someone uh, who goes to a point of uh, a... It's one of the words that would be used, for instance, of the effect of an intoxication that you're led to a bliss in some sort of a sense in that way. It literally comes from the idea of what we sometimes call a saga, is a journey that one's on that uh, brings one to many places. Well, that's the idea here. The many joys that would be brought. He says, you don't let that be there with somebody else outside. You let that be with her and her love. Not somebody else causing you to go on these journeys of some sort of uh, uh, joy or whatever else that's there, this action that's only a physical kind of uh, a pleasure. But you be enraptured with her love is a sense, not just the physical, there's the emotional. There's that tie all together that's there within marriage. And there's more involved than just the physical sensation. It is a binding, a helping, a tying together that pulls two people to a greater unity. He says, now why should you be enraptured with an immoral woman? The word immoral woman is the word that is typically used, euphemistically it's used of a prostitute. Can you think of anybody in the Bible that was married to a prostitute? Hosea. And what happened with him? Was that a good situation? Okay. All right. You have the first child that is there, and it's thought maybe that's Hosea. The second child, the name given, shows Hosea was pretty sure that wasn't his. The third, absolutely certain that was not his child at all. And now after all of that and her being one who had been passed around in the streets as it was put, then God says to her now, or says to Hosea, now you go back to her and you love her again. Why? What was he trying to teach Hosea? What was he trying to teach us? God says, this is what you've done to me. I've been a loving husband, and here's the way you've acted. Is there anybody that doesn't see the heart-rending nature of that? And that's what we need to see. When you look at Hosea, if you think about committing adultery, read that book. There's a temptation that's there. Go back and take the time to go through that book and say, do I want to do this to my spouse? Do I want to do this to God? 
I tell you what, if you can continue on and do it then, your heart's pretty close. It's come to a place pretty deep. What we need to understand is here, that immoral woman, this one that was like a prostitute, he said, if you go out there and you're enraptured in her love, what's that going to end like? Does that have any possibility of a good? Let me ask you something. What's the difference between the first time in adultery and the 1,000th time in adultery? In principle. They show the depth to which one's gone. But there's no difference with regard to the right. It never was a right. It wasn't closer in that first time or second or third or fourth, and now it's really bad after a thousand. All it is is the same evil is per perpetuated. And now you've got more of the consequence that is building up there. But it's the same evil from start to finish. And he says, why should you do that? And be embraced in the arms of a seductor. What's she going to do tomorrow? She's going to embrace somebody else. And you got to think you were anything special. You were just an ordinary one to be used. Same thing goes on the other side of that with man. A girl who listens to a young man come along and say, oh, I understand you and all these things. He is not interested in understanding or helping you or anything else. He's interested in sin. He's interested in a brief moment of there being some satisfaction of his desire. That's it. He's going to tell somebody else the same thing. And he's probably already told a bunch of others the same thing before this. If we keep the sexuality within the marriage relationship the way God intended it. It is the most enjoyable. It is the most useful. It brings people together to where they can't go apart from one another. You know, it's just one of those things where when you think about why in the world would I want to build a relationship of that kind of sense when you have a relationship that a husband and wife that can be built to get better and better and better and better. I always tell Leslie every day, I love you more than I did yesterday and I mean it. That doesn't take place outside of the marriage. That's not going to be there in sin. That's only possible when there's that kind of a closeness in about 15 minutes to start the prayer service. Heavenly Father, we 